tonight we are um, we're, we're going to continue our study in the parables of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 13 verses 1 through 9. If you uh, want to pause me while you look it up, you go right ahead. Starting in chapter 13 verse 1, that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up. And since they had no depth of soil, uh, when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them out. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So he who has ears, let him hear. Ah, interesting thing, uh, an interesting parable that Jesus talked about in this. So uh, you have your outlines. If you have, if you don't have your outlines, go ahead and print them up. And, and But let's look at, let's, let's take a look. Let's unpack this parable and see what it says to us. Now, the first point we need to understand out of that is when Jesus is talking about the seed, okay? He's talking about God's word. He's talking about the Bible. Let me just tell you some interesting things about seeds. Number one, a seed may be dried and it may have been sitting in a packet for a year or two years or three years, but seeds have life in them. I read a report many years ago about in when they uh, discovered King Tut, Tutankhamun's uh, grave pyramid, and they looked inside of it and they found uh, what looked like dried tomato and it shriveled away to hardly, but there were some seeds inside of it, and they thought, ah, let's go ahead and plant them, see what happens. And tomatoes came up. So those seeds had been laying dormant for a thousand or two years, uh, yeah, more like 2,000 years, and they planted them, and, they, knew, and, and they, they watered them, and they fertilized them, and boom, here you had fruit. Now, seeds, since they're alive, B will be on here, produce fruit. Let me just give you some examples of that. In Romans chapter 1, verse 13, when we produce fruit, we become soul winners. We are focusing an extended time on evangelism, on getting people back and getting new people in. And it's, exciting. it's an exciting time as we pivot from the pandemic and we move off into doing what we're here to do. And, and when our seeds grow, Romans chapter 6, 22, we discover true holiness. Romans 15, verse 27 says, then we share what we have with those who don't have it. And we've been given the seed of the gospel, and there are those who don't have the seed, and we give it to them. Galatians 5, and 23 said that when we bear fruit, we develop integrity. Colossians 1, 10 says we begin a life of good works. Hebrews 13, 15 says we praise God and witness him in our life. So, so we have seeds that have life in them and seeds that produce fruit. But the third thing about a seed is it's got to be planted to do any good. It's got to be put in the ground and cultured and cultivated and nurtured and protected. You see, Jesus in this parable said it's not enough for us just to listen to the word. We've got to hear the word. We've got to plant that word in our heart. We've got to cultivate it. We've got to culture it. We've got to nurture it. We've got to protect it so it'll take root and grow. Seven times in this parable and 19 times in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus uses the word hear. He's saying, don't just listen, but let this stuff sink in past your ears and into your heart. You ever talk to somebody and it doesn't look like they're paying attention and you say to them, you haven't heard a word I say, tell me what I said. And they're able to say it back word for word, but then they don't go do anything with it. That's the difference between hearing and listening. See, Jesus said, I want you to soak this stuff in. I want you to listen to me and hear me to the point where it changes your life. Point number two. The sower is someone who shares the word. 
the original sower was Jesus Christ. I mean, if fair was fair, he should uh, ha have come as the one who got to harvest. But you see, when Jesus planted seeds, there wasn't a harvest because it takes time for a seed to grow. It takes three years to grow asparagus. And, and, so, and so it being that it takes time, that he didn't get to see the harvest in its fullness. You see, the Jews that rejected Jesus were teaching their own traditions as gospel. You've got to keep this holy day, you've got to keep this certain dietary restriction, and you've got to keep, you've got to be able to say this right away, and you've got to be able to answer the question the right way. You've got to be able to discern whether I'm trying to maneuver you into a trap. I mean, they just flat out rejected him. The Pharisees and the scribes, they embalmed the past so much that Jesus had to come down and break down the traditions so he could recover the seed that was still there. Then he had to break apart the seed to find the part of the seed that was alive. So we've got to do that today. We've got to have that today, don't we? I mean, it takes faith for us to go to school and plant seeds of Jesus, whether you're at, whether you're at U of H, whether you're at A&M, whether you're at UT, whether you're at ACU, whether you're at Alvin Community College or Houston Community College or any one of the high schools that are represented at Westbury Church of Christ. It takes faith to go into that hallways, those hallways, and plant the seeds of Jesus among your fellow students. Jesus ultimately entrusted 12 guys to do it. And he planted them, and he cultured them, and he cultivated them, and he nurtured them, and he protected them because the future of the church depended on how they heard what they'd been given. And they did a pretty good job because here we are today. We're a church that patterns ourselves after the New Testament. We're a New Testament church. These days, it's interesting because even within our own brotherhood, there are congregations that have decided we don't want to be a first century church. We want to be a 21st century church. And so to do that, we've got to take God's word. We've got to minimize what it says so it fits in with the culture of today. And Jesus said, I came to be the culture, not to adapt to the culture. So anybody who sows God's word, shares God's word as a sower. Now, let me tell you how many different kinds of, 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 of ways you can sow the gospel. It could be a good sermon. I, I absolutely love it when somebody comes up and says to me, hey, I take your outline to work. And during the week, we've got a Bible study that we use your outline. Great, that's why I give them to you. Uh, so it may be a good sermon. It may be ministering to somebody who's not a believer, who's going through a tough time about Jesus. It may be a sentence in a letter or a song that you write, if it's got God's word in it, it is a seed being sown. Now, let me give you quickly three things we need to know about sowing. Number one, we've got to be personally concerned. Let me say that another way. We gotta have some skin in the game. If we wanna see the seed grow, We've got to water that seed, sometimes with our tears, sometimes with our sweat, but we've got to do that. Psalm 126, verse 5 and 6 says, Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves, okay, that's crop, with him. So we've got to have some skin in the game. We've got to be personally involved in people's lives. Second is we have to have a principle of partnership. Because if we want to see souls added to the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, we've got to understand that it takes more than us to make it happen. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And then third, we've got to have patience to plant seeds. James 5 talks about a farmer and says, the farmer understands how important it is to be patient and wait for the rain. Then... After the, the growing time, the crop's ready to harvest. Now, where I grew up, it was cotton. Cotton was king. And the, so you would see the farmers out in the field, the cotton farmers out in the field, and they're planting their cotton seed and, and doing all of that kind of stuff, tilling their soil, getting it ready, plant the, plant the seed, and then you just wait. There's a kind of farmer in Lubbock called a dryland farmer. And that's somebody that depends on rain. See, there was a, you have irrigation or you didn't. And there were plenty of folks that didn't. And they prayed for that rain because that rain would what be, would what, 
would be what would grow that crop. And then after the time of growing the crop, it's ready to harvest. So it takes patience to plant seed. But we've also got to make sure we plant the correct seed. You see, we can plant, there's all different kinds of seeds we can plant. We can plant the seed of, of discord and, he, and, and reap a horrible harvest of a fighting of a church that fights. We can plant the seed of lust and get a horrible crop uh, uh, of people who are out of control with their emotions. We can, we, we can abuse the bride of Christ. I, I mean, so not only is it important to be patient, but it's also important to grow the right to, to plant the right stuff and know what it is we're putting in the ground. Nobody here, nobody listening to this or watching this would ever get on a plane without knowing where the plane's going. We have a board that's in front of us at the gate that says this is the flight that's going to Atlanta. This is the flight that's going to Mexico City. This is the flight that's going to Seattle. This is the flight that's going to New York City. We don't just get on a plane and hope we're going somewhere. So we've got to know what we're putting in the ground. So that was the seed. Let's move on to the soil because the soil represents our heart. Soil has potential. It really does. Now, you can take poor soil and put nutrients and stuff like that and still grow your pretty good crop. All you have to do is go to Arizona and out there in the desert, they've got some magnificent tomatoes and onions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and so, but, but soil has potential. You see, you take a plot, a piece of ground. My father bought 30-something acres in, uh, up, near, uh, up near Livingston in Goodrich. Many of you have been up to that place uh, and have seen it. And it was a jungle when he took it over. And a couple of hurricanes with a couple of trees blown down on the house and having to get new roofs and, and stuff like that. He decided, you know what, I'm going to clear this property and I'm going to turn it into useful, not dangerous. And so that's what he did. I, I read a story, read a story about a guy who bought a, an abandoned lot and turned it into the most beautiful rose garden you've ever seen in your life. And the preacher uh, came by and looked at it. And, uh, and, and the preacher had, had come out before the man bought the land and, and, and the preacher had a prayer over it that God would bless him. And then after he had transformed this into this beautiful rose garden, he invited the preacher back out to take a look at it. And the preacher said, my, 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 hasn't God done wonders with this piece of land? And the guy looked at him and said, you know, no disrespect to you. But you should have seen what it looked like when God had it all by himself. Good point. God uses us to get the best out of the ground. But left to us alone, our hearts will become jungles. That's why we must have God in there. You see, Jesus tells us that there are four kinds of hearts in this world. And he identifies those kinds of hearts according to the way they respond to the seed of God's word. He says first, there's a hard heart. That's chapter 13, verse 19. Now... If you've ever been on a farm, uh, you'll know that there are little paths. That's the way that everybody's taken to get to this building or that building or the outbuilding or the barn. And over time, it becomes a beaten path and, uh, and nothing grows on it. It's just kind of hard dirt. And when you're planting, seeds tend to fall on that little piece of pathway. The problem is, it's been packed down so much that the ground's hard and the seed doesn't sink in. And then the birds come along and the birds eat it. You see, God's word's got to sink in to our hearts. It's got to sink in to our hearts. It's got to sink into our lives. It, it, we've got to understand God before we can ever begin this process of being spiritual. So when it sinks in, that's when we respond to it. So let me just say this. If it's been a long time since God's word has moved you, your soil has gotten hard. So you got to plow it up. Plow it up again so that it can be useful. If it doesn't sink into the ground, the problem isn't the seed. The problem is the soil of our heart. Now, can a hard heart be changed? Yep. you got to plow it up. You have to turn some dirt. 
Your heart may be torn up right now by a circumstance in your life. It just might be God allowing that so that it will be ready to grow his seed. Now, the second one he talks about is the shallow heart. Matthew chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Every now and then, if you're walking along uh, and, and you're out in the field, you find a big rock that's just under the surface. I, I can remember uh, listening to my uncles talk about a piece of property that they had that they tried to grow a crop on, and they said all they could grow was rocks. Every year, it seemed like more rocks were working their way up to the surface. And, and, so, and, and so rocks that are just below the surface, they tend to stop things from growing. And when the, Because when the soil is thin, the roots can't get down very far. Okay, so the plant comes up, but it's got no roots in it. And when it's got no roots in it, nowhere that it can get, nowhere that it can get uh, nourishment, it withers away and dies. I learned that... If you have a if, if that if you have a manhole cover in your backyard, okay, the best place in the world to plant a tree is somewhere close to that manhole cover, okay, because that's a sewer and it's carrying and there's water and nutrients that are down in that soil and it tends to be moist and it tends to be rich and 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 I've had more success growing fruit trees as long as they could tap into the sewer line just a little bit and, and get the nutrition that they need uh, that because they need plants especially the roots especially here so this heart represents somebody who's emotional who hears God's word and accepts God's word but doesn't do anything to study and grow in God's word so God's word never takes root it's there it just never takes root. Look, there is a place for emotion in our faith. There is a place that when we can, when we feel God's presence, but there's also a place for roots to grow down so that when the tough times come, we can withstand it. So the problem with the hard heart is a lack of understanding. That's what we talked about before. The problem with the shallow heart is a lack of depth. Which brings us to the third kind of soil and heart. By the way, let me go back a little bit and talk about that. Because every now and then, we get mad at God. And that's perfectly okay. God perfectly understands when we get mad at him. You read the book of Psalms, and it seems like David's mad at God in every other psalm. Uh, and, uh, and so rooted is very important there. Because I've known people who got mad at God and walked away from God because they were mad at God. I can't believe he did that. And when you're rooted, you understand that, hey, sin and the results of sin uh, don't come from God, that it comes from us. It comes from our stuff. You know, that all, God, didn't, God didn't plan for us to get cancer and die. That came when Adam and Eve fell into the temptation that Satan came because then death was introduced. And so when bad things happen, don't blame God, okay? Don't, don't blame God. Uh, which brings us to the third kind of soil, and there is the crowded heart. Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. Here's what I've learned. Uh, I, I'm a lousy gardener. I'm good at growing trees, okay? Because you just kind of dig a hole in the ground and put the tree there and leave it and, and water it and stuff like that. Actually, here you can you just stick a sprig of mint in the ground and it grows, um, which I love. Gardens, I'm not so good at. I, you know, I can't grow tomatoes. I've talked to people that grow tomatoes and and, uh, and they tell you, you got to start in February and you have to start preparing the soil and whip it up to a froth and, and do all this kind of thing. And you get the good. I'm not good at that. I'm sorry. Let me tell you the main reason I am not good at a garden. Okay. Not all, see, as a gardener, I love the tomatoes and I love the roses and I love all that kind of stuff that they produce. My problem is I don't hate the weeds enough to get out and keep them out of the garden. I, you know, in order for somebody to really be able to grow, you've got to hate the weeds as much as you love the fruit. And, and, and so the soil he's talking about in verse 22 
is dirty soil. It's got weed seed in it. Now, let me tell you something. According to the State Department, Texas State Department of Agriculture, there are 70-something indigenous, or indigenous means they just grow by themselves. They, you, have, you don't have to plant a seed for it to grow. 70-something indigenous weeds to South Texas, where we live, to the coastal plains. That's what they call this, the coastal plains where we live. Now, I don't know about that, but I know a good 60 of them are growing in my yard. And, and, and I didn't do anything to get them there. But plants, on the other hand, have to be cultivated. Weeds don't have to be cultivated. Weeds just grow by themselves. We don't have to plant them. They don't need our help. In this parable, the weeds are the influences that this world, I don't talk, I'm not talking about this globe. I'm talking about the systems that are in this world that they lay on us. You know, the weeds are the thing that when we're trying to, to celebrate the Lord's Supper on Sunday, right in the middle of it comes, ooh, I've got to pay a bill. And, or, or you find out about it, you find you're struggling about something. It's interesting that we understand that the first three hearts we talk about did not find salvation. They are going to hell. I can't be any plainer than that. Our proof of salvation is in hearing the word or having a quick emotional response to the word or even cultivating the word. No, the proof that were, the proof of our salvation, the proof that we're saved in Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, is what kind of fruit are we bearing? So the fourth point is a fruitful heart. See, a fruitful heart comprehends the word. It understands God's word. And it's rooted deep enough to handle any of the hard times that are going to come in our lives. I, I want you to think about the woman at Jacob's well in Samaria. <clears throat> The one who had been married five times and the one she was living with wasn't her husband. I want you to think about her, okay? Because when Jesus found her, her heart, the soil in her heart was hard. Now, let me just tell you how come. I'm not going not to cover any new ground here. But this country, Samaria, it was an experiment. It was a genetic experiment by the Babylonians. And they said, let's form a country where we're going to put Arabs and Jews together and force them to intermingle and force them to get married and have kids and let's see what that looks like. Let's see how long it takes them to become accepted into the Middle East. And the, the problem was that they never were accepted. They did, they did, they, they intermarried, they had kids, they even had their own hybrid faith so that everything, they could do everything. But the Jews didn't like them, and the Arabs didn't. The, Jew, the Jews didn't like them because they weren't Jewish. The Arabs didn't like them because they weren't Arabs. So it was a mistake that had gone wrong. So basically what you had was a country where everybody hated you. You, you didn't have anybody for any other friendly country. They, they hated you. You, you know, <clears throat> they, didn't even <clears throat> they didn't even talk to each other. But Jesus started talking to her. And she walked in with a hard heart. <clears throat> and as Jesus was talking, her heart went from being a hard heart to a shallow heart. And, and, and Jesus offered her living water. He says, I, I want you to drink. And, and she says, well, here's the well. And he says, no, 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 I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about physical water. I'm talking about spiritual water. Because the water I'm offering you is water that will make you that will that you will never be thirsty again. And so Jesus knew her heart was shallow. So he started plowing. And he started breaking up the old soil. And and he said to her, Go get your husband. He knew she didn't have a husband. So then her heart went from being shallow to being crowded. There were lots of things in there that were keeping the, 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 the weed from growing. She started arguing about church. Well, where should I worship and, and, and how should I worship? And you tell me all about religion because I can tell you a thing or two about religion. And Jesus told her, you know what? Where you worship isn't important. Only that you worship in spirit and truth. Well, then her heart, after it was plowed up, became good soil. How do you know that? 
she began to bear fruit. She told everybody she knew of that there was this guy sitting at the well that changed her life for the better forever. You know, well, what about the five husbands? I don't know what she did with the five husbands. What about the one she was living with? I don't know about the one she was living with. All I know is her heart became good, plowable. The soil in her heart became good, and the process was complete when she started bearing fruit. Now, let's finish up by asking some pretty straightforward questions. Number one, what do we think about God's Word? Do we dig into it? I'm digging first thing in the morning, man. I'm opening God's Word and I'm reading it. Or do we put off hearing what it has to say? I decided one day <clears throat> I was going to read the Bible through in less than a year. And in that time that I read, uh, I was very conscious. First thing I did, get up, read. I missed three days of reading my Bible. Uh, and, and it just never crossed my mind. Uh, in that. But in that whole time, I missed three days of that. I, you know, that's, I wish I would have gotten it straight through, but I'm all right with that. You know, I love digging into God's Word. I love finding the little threads that connect it and doing all kinds of things like that. The second question we've got to ask ourselves is, at this time, at this, on this day, in this year, in this moment, what kind of soil's in your heart right now? I guarantee it's one of four. It's either hard, shallow, weedy, or receptive. It's either bitter, bitter. It's either bitter. It's got rocks in it. It's got weeds in it, or it's good soil. And then the third is, if we are receptive to the word. Oh, and here's the bottom line. Do we have any fruit? to prove it. You know, who's going to be in heaven because of us? Because fruit is what proves what kind of soil we have in our heart. Let's pray. Our God, I ask that you be with us as we study through this parable and these parables as we study over the next several weeks. Father, that you'll be with us and that you'll guide us and that you'll bring us to a place where our hearts are fertile for you. Now, Father, we ask that you'll be with the Westbury Church, her elders, their wives, our deacons, their wives and families, our ministers and their wives and families. Father, I ask that you bless them. Father, be with the folks that are members here at Westbury, that their hearts be receptive, that they be fruitful and fulfilled, and that it is a blessing to come to this place of worship. Father, I ask you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a good week.